I've been on this journey towards Cambodia for the last few months. And it all started when Pastor Bruce walked into my office. And like he normally does when he walks into my office, it means my day is about to change. And he said, we need to do something about child sponsorship. And I said, oh, okay, what's that look like? He said, oh, I don't know, you figure it out. <laughs> so I went to the national office as I was there for board meetings for the pension plan, and I walked into the Erdo office. I said, what could this look like? What could it look like if our church decided we wanted to get involved in child sponsorship? And they gave us a few options, and as we started to pray about it, we really felt that God was leading us as a church towards Cambodia. And so in January, uh, right as this whole coronavirus really kicked off, I got on a plane, left Vancouver, and went to Hong Kong. Then on to Cambodia. <laughs> but as I was there, the very first thing I did, uh, as I got off the plane and met our missionaries, Ian and Tiffany, who I believe are watching us right now, and I say hi to them, they sent me on a little tuk-tuk, and they said, you gotta go to the killing fields. You have to understand what shapes this nation before you see it. And so I went there, and you can see this picture up on the screen of, of this memorial that commemorates at this one of over 300 sites where between two and three million Cambodians were killed in a three and a half year period. One in four Cambodians lost their lives. What does that look like in your family? Who's missing? My family of six likely means two of us don't make it through that. How does that shape a nation? How does that transform everyone's perspective? So it was important that I understood the gravity of that situation, because to be honest, when I went to Cambodia, other than a quick Google search, I really didn't know that much about the country. And so then we got to start to see what's really going on, and they, they took me to a few different places. The first was Prevang, where we did camps. And, and what a blessing to see the ministry that's happening there, to see how, what can be when a community center's built, when there's water and sanitation that's implemented, and when our global workers, along with the CCP program, get to share the love of God with the kids. You can see in the picture, there's hundreds of kids there. Hundreds of kids. And you know what the greatest thing is? We didn't run the camp. Me, Ian, and Tiffany, we took support roles Ian played the music. He hit the, he hit the buttons. Cambodians, people who have come under their ministry, who have learned who Jesus is and have been transformed by the gospel, led those camps. It's a powerful story. Then we went to Sansok. And that's a town that was formed because the government decided they wanted an area of Phnom Penh. They wanted it for development. And so what they did is they, they burned the, the whole area and had buses there for the people to load onto and took them out 45 minutes from where they were and said, here you go, start again. CCP Erdo has been there for over 10 years. Kids from that program are now starting their university education. 30 of the kids on this wall are from that community. But all of that was leading up to the last community we were going to visit. The community that we as a church have the opportunity to lean into. It's Ang Snool. And as I was there that day, I was full of conflicted emotions. And so I made a video that day so I would remember and capture for you what I was feeling. So let's watch that together. Good morning, Calvary Temple. I'm here in the community of Ang Snool with very mixed emotions. On one hand, as I look around and see uh, very poor living conditions, I see a, a community that is uh, reliant on the factories nearby and, uh, and, and saddened, deeply saddened. And yet on the other hand, I'm full of hope. This is the community that we are gonna have an opportunity as a church to be a part of the transformation. You see, five years ago, there was a church plant done here by the local congregation in Phnom Penh. 
and today there is a small gathering that is beginning. On Sundays, uh, between 10 and 20 adults and 30 to 40 kids meet together and transformation of the gospel has begun. And now we get the opportunity to come alongside, to help build a community center, to sponsor children, to see hope brought to this community. Not only the hope of Jesus, but a hope that involves an education, a hope that involves a future for their children, and a hope that we can be a part of. I encourage you today to come and be a part of transforming this community. I'm looking forward to that weather getting back here in Winnipeg. That looked pretty nice. But we have an opportunity to invest in a country today and over the next few weeks. And, it, and right there in that town, in that moment, the weight of the opportunity hit me full bore. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how the gospel and helping people has to go together. It's got to be both. In Luke 4, 14 to 22, the Bible's idea of salvation is not just a ticket to heaven, but the fullness of shalom, of wholeness for the complete person. Ambiguity is when the meaning of a word, phrase, or sentence is uncertain. There could be more than one meaning. For instance, it's ambiguous to say, I rode a black horse in red pajamas. Was the horse wearing the red pajamas or was I? The sentence becomes clear when it's restructured. Wearing red pajamas, I rode a black horse. Now, I'm not sure when I'd ever do that. It's more likely the horse would actually be wearing the pajamas. But hey, most of the time you want to avoid ambiguity. But sometimes it's useful. Comedians use it all the time. I've heard it said that outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside a dog, it's just too dark to read. Or, or sometimes you just really don't know what to say, right? Early in our marriage, Becky once asked me, did you enjoy the meal I made? My response was this. I have never tasted a chicken quite like that one before. Was it good or bad? I'm not going to tell you. The Bible is full of ambiguities, not by mistake, but deliberate ambiguities. In Genesis 1-2, where it says the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Hebrew word is ruach, spirit or wind. I think the ambiguity is deliberate. Or Romans 10-4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Is Christ the end of the law as a principle for ruling? Our lives, or is Christ the goal, most complete example of the law fulfilled? The answer is yes. Yes to both. Or John 3, you must be born again. But it could equally be translated, you must be born from above. Well, which is it? Why can't it be both? There's a deliberate ambiguity to make us go deeper into the mystery of the Bible. Well, this morning I want to introduce you to a deliberately ambiguous passage. Jesus has been baptized, and you may recall the Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. And everyone heard the voice of the Father. You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Then, filled with the Spirit, he was led into the wilderness, where he fasted for 40 days and was tempted. And having come off of that successfully, Luke says... Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. The same Spirit leads him home to officially begin his public ministry. He's teaching in the synagogues, and people are eating it up. Matthew tells us he is healing people and preaching the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is on task, doing what God made him for. The crowds love it. What's not to love? Then he preaches in his home church, and it's a fiasco. He's given a scroll of Isaiah, and Je Jesus deliberately looks up this scripture from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then this happens, and I bet you could hear a pin drop. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You see, Christ confronts us with a choice. Now people in that moment have to take a stand. They have to make a decision. What do they think about this guy who claims the Spirit of the Lord is upon him? No, not on Isaiah, not on the suffering servant, but on him. But when he says, today the Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, he means the Spirit is on him. Well, there's no ambiguity there. At first, they don't know what to make of it. They didn't catch the full importance of it. They had all spoken well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph, son? they asked. Well, he sure is a great guy. I mean, powerful speaker, that guy. Yeah, but but isn't that like Joseph's son? But the more they thought about it, and the more he said, well, it just didn't sit right with them. And then it all hit the fan. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Some of them were ready to kill him. This Jesus, whatever you think of him, he had a way of polarizing people. What did he say that got them so upset? Well, it starts with those verses he said he was there to fulfill. Just what is Jesus' mission? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me. The word anointed is a pretty powerful word. It literally means to rub oil on something like they would pour oil to anoint priests or kings. The Greek word that Luke uses is the same one from which we get the word Christ. And it translates a Hebrew word in Isaiah 61 from which we get Messiah. Now, there are several places where Jesus gives us purpose statements, and they don't all say the same thing. In John 10, 10, it says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. These are not statements that contradict one another. No, instead they need to be knit together into a unifying vision. But the significance of this mission statement in Luke 4 is that it becomes significant for Luke's portrait of Jesus. If you want to get Luke, if you want to get Acts, I think you've got to get this. So then what? What is Jesus' mission? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to proclaim a decree to heal the disease and liberate the despised. And he did it to serve the poor, the prisoners, the blind, and the oppressed. You see, the gospel is good news for the marginalized. You know who I'm talking about when I say that. You've seen them. People that fall through the cracks. Maybe you know them. Maybe they're the the people that you used to make fun of in school. The losers, the outcasts. Or maybe you are one of them. Or you've been one of them. What about the least, the last, the lost, the lonely? What about them? Jesus is out for them. 
What if I'm, what if I'm middle class, though? Comfortable. Busy. Is it good news for me? It's pretty clear that being physically poor doesn't make you spiritually worthy. In the same way that owning a big house or having a cottage at the lake doesn't mean that you're, sp- you're not spiritually oppressed. Our circumstances are not the qualifying measure for receiving God's grace. In Luke, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. In Matthew, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The key is not losing sight of one side of this or the other. Look at this last phrase in Luke. He has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What you don't know unless you read it from Isaiah 61 is that Jesus stops right there. In mid-sentence, it's a deafening pause. Everybody knows what's next. Everyone in that room knows what the next phrase says. It's to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus doesn't go there. No, this isn't the day of vengeance. Not yet. This is the year of the Lord's favor. And what he sets out here is the entire program of Luke's gospel. And the church is called a ministry in Acts. The gospel, Jesus is saying, is God's jubilee. In the Old Testament, every seven years was a year of Sabbath. Rest for the land. After seven sets of this, the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. A time for setting people free. And again, Jesus takes this very literal idea and fills it with all kinds of spiritual power. You see, the gospel is hope. Setting people free. This Jubilee idea is a great picture of the gospel. It's a temporary solution for a fallen world. Where is our focus? Are we looking on the here and now? Or the bigger picture of this earth being just a temporary home? Jubilee meant freedom, liberty, debts were forgiven, slaves were set free, land went back to its ancestral owners. It was a reset on everything. Jubilee was a reminder of lordship. The land is mine. Redemption. Rest. Jubilee is a picture of faith and obedience, hope, new beginnings for everybody. In some ways, it's kind of a picture of heaven, a kind of return to Eden, just like the gospel is a reboot for our personal life. It's kind of a reboot for humanity, a recalibration of the nation. Jesus says his ministry, the gospel, is good news to the poor, freedom for the the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed. Stop for a moment here. Ask yourself this. How does my spirituality reflect this side of the gospel? How does the faith I practice each and every day reflect these very specific ideas? So what is the gospel? The world tells us to separate church and state. That services and religion don't belong together. But here in this church, we say service will only happen if it's in conjunction with the gospel. When I think about our food bank, each week 150 families come here to receive food. And we have told them we will not do this We will not be the host. We will not serve people in this way unless it comes with the ability to share Jesus with them. We would be doing them a disservice to have them come in our church and get food and not tell them about the Jesus that can save their life, that can make all the difference and transform their heart, body, and mind. And so we show Christian films while they wait. Someone will share a quick word. We'll invite them to Alpha. 
And we invite them to investigate who Jesus is and what he wants to do in their life. Now, you know I love camp. But if camp is only about the activities we run, we've missed it. The boats, the rock climbing, the bikes, all of those activities, all they are are tools to make connections with kids so that we have the opportunity to share hope with them, to tell them about Jesus. It has to go together. The gospel is personal salvation, yes, reconnecting with God. But more than personal salvation alone, it's personal salvation resulting in tr- social transformation. Reconnecting with God's vision of the world. My question today is, how did these two things ever get separated? How did we ever think it was okay to be a social club and not tell people about Jesus? And how did we ever think it was okay to tell people about Jesus, but see them in need and not help them? It has to go together. It's not one or the other. We've watched generations in our history swing back and forth on that pendulum, and it's time to stop the pendulum and bring them together once again, like we do here in our church when we do these programs. Because one without the other is empty. The gospel becomes really good news when we do both. He has shown all you people what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. People need to have the spiritual experience, but we as believers are called to love mercy mercy. Our hearts need to be moved to action. It's not me saying it. It's a command right from the Word of God to act justly. When we do all of this together, that's when the gospel becomes truly good news. Church, we have this incredible opportunity to invest in the children of Cambodia. We have an incredible opportunity to invest in a country where 80% of the people living there have experienced sexual abuse or harm in some way. We have an opportunity to invest in a country that is ripe for a harvest. Let's watch this video together. We're in Sainsuk Village, which is a village with over 10,000 families, and we are in village number five, which has 20,000 families in this tiny little area. I am global worker Tiffany Rowley here in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Here in Cambodia, my main role is Child Care Plus, and we have 13 different CCP communities throughout the country in seven different provinces. And what that looks like is you as a sponsor would sponsor a child for $41 a month through Child Care Plus, and that provides education, school supplies, school uniforms, a nutritional supplement each month, medical care, and all the way through to post-secondary uh, college or a trade. And so those are all the things that my office take care of here in Cambodia. The communities that we work with here in Cambodia range from rural poverty to urban poverty. And so we have a big dynamic amongst the children and the families that we work with. And uh, in this community in particular, which is where we are today in Science Up, Uh, The communities here do not have access to their own land. They have no land rights. Water and sanitation is very difficult. Some have it, some don't. And so we are working directly with those families, not just to alleviate some of the physical aspects that they are walking through, but to bring holistic development to who they are in Christ as well. The chiefs and the elders of these communities are coming to us and they're wanting more kids in the program. And it's because they see that the families of CCP are different than the families in the in their surrounding areas. And I'm happy to say that that is because of a transformed life, because of the gospel. When you sponsor a child, you're actually able to stop 
this, not only the cycle of poverty through education, but through the family dynamics, you are able to stop human trafficking. When a mom comes to know the Lord, the value of life changes for that family. She will no longer allow her kids to be put in vulnerable situations. She will no longer allow them to be sold for sex. Um, the dad, when he comes to know the Lord, all of a sudden has a value for his wife and his children. And so child sponsorship is essentially ending the cycle of abuse in various forms here in Cambodia. We're right at the very cusp of having our CCP kids graduate grade 12, go to post-secondary, go to university. And already, even though they're in their university studies, they are giving back to their community through teaching English and music in the church or in the community, in the community center. And they have a desire to see the families in their communities where they once were to also be changed as they are being changed. To those of you who've sponsored kids currently and in the past through Child Care Plus, I want to say a huge thank you. Your investment is for the children of tomorrow. These kids are growing up knowing the Lord and wanting their nation to be changed, not just for Him, but in the physical sense as well. They are not satisfied to have the Cambodia that they grew up with be the Cambodia of tomorrow, and they desire change, and that is what's going to happen. I was in Cambodia with David Adcock, who's the CEO of Verdo, and one of the things he told me is that the international standard to see change in a nation is that 3,000 kids get sponsored. Currently in Cambodia, there's 550 kids sponsored, and to be honest, church, I don't see how we get from 550 to 3,000. But I believe that God is calling us to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves, we have a chance to invest in a country, whether it's through the community center, which we're going to hear more about in the coming weeks. We're going to try to raise $30,000 to complete this community center in Ang Snul. Or today, there's, there's children here that we can sponsor. And how do we do that? For me, it starts right here with these two that we're going to introduce to our family that we have decided are going to be our sponsor children. I had the privilege of meeting Sesa when I was there in Cambodia. And when I look into her eyes and see the hope, I can't help but be changed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a part of our church, that we are here to serve you. And Lord, we pray by your Holy Spirit that you would draw us to a place of surrender, that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours, that you would, uh, by your Spirit, lead us to how we are to be involved in Cambodia. And Lord, we pray that as we look at this, as we consider child sponsorship, as we consider investing in a community, that we would re be responsive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to tell you a little bit more about this little girl. When I looked at her, I couldn't help but seeing my own little girl. She lives in a community that her hope is that she will one day get to work in a factory and live in a six by nine room with her family. That's the best case scenario. Worst case, her, her family feels pressure of the financial needs and allows her to be sold into the sex trade. My little girl here in Canada has the whole world in front of her. Every opportunity in this country is given to people to decide where they want to go and what they want to do in their life. But for little Seesaw, she doesn't have that same chance. But for $41 a month, I can help feed her family. I can help give her medical care, access to an education. It can completely transform her life and the life of her family. You see, the problem is I can't unknow what I know. Before I went, I could claim ignorance. I can't anymore. I've been in her village and I've seen her and in that moment, I fell in love with her. 
we are making these two children a part of our family. We will, we will pray for them. Just like we pray for our kids every night. Church, we get an opportunity all the way on the other side of the world to invest in a country that desperately needs it. And you know what? When I think of missions, you know what? I don't want to be a part of something small. When I hear that 3,000 kids can change a nation, that's something I want to be a part of. You know what? It's so much bigger than me. How can I ever possibly change Cambodia? But together, trusting God, allowing the Holy Spirit to move, we can all be a part of seeing a nation changed for Jesus. So please consider If you would like to sponsor a child this morning, there's tables up at the top, there's a table in the back, there's profiles that you can look, read their stories, open it up. And if you decide to sponsor a child, there's a second pamphlet inside, and it's a very simple form to fill out. We will send it to Erdo. All the details are there. But today, would you please consider that as you go, being a part of a hope and a future for children's lives, all these 130 kids so we can take down these pictures and we can send them home with you. And that they can be a part of families, spiritual families that will love and pray for these kids, that God would protect them, heart, body, and mind in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the burden that you have put on my heart to pray for these children. And Lord, I don't know how this is all going to be completed. I don't understand it, but Lord, I believe you can do it. And so Lord, my part, my portion, I'm willing to give to you freely, knowing that it is not nearly enough to accomplish what is required for that nation, but knowing that you can multiply it and do exceedingly above all that we can ask or imagine. So Lord, we pray that you would bless each one as they go today, that you would walk with them this week, and that you would have provision over their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.